My name is Erica Page. As Natalie said, I am the founder and editor of Living Dappled, an online uh, women's blog and membership network um, supporting the community through inspiration and education. I've personally lived with vitiligo since I was seven years old. Over the course of 20 years, I lost 100% of my skin's pigment and am starting to lose pigment in my hair. Um, as Natalie also mentioned, I am actually here in a hotel room in Minneapolis, Minnesota for the 2022 USA World Vitiligo Day Conference. I am so excited to get to be here and celebrate with everyone this weekend. Um, and it's great that I get to celebrate with you all too. I feel like I get the best of both worlds. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Today, I get to speak with you all about one of my favorite topics, and that is the power of community and how you can use this tool to really help you live with vitiligo. Now, when I talk about community, what I'm talking about is there we go. Um, I'm talking specifically about connection with other people with vitiligo. As many of us know, um, it's easy to feel isolated um, or lonely when you live with vitiligo, even though 1% of the world lives with vitiligo, and that's actually a staggering amount of people. The reality is that day to day, um, most of us aren't running into other people with vitiligo. And when we do talk about vitiligo with our friends and family, sometimes we're misunderstood or it's hard for our family to really understand what we're going through. And so as a result, um, you might feel lonely um, and you might even not consider reaching out to um, connect with other people living with the same condition. That was certainly my story growing up with vitiligo. I didn't speak to another person with a condition until I was in my early 20s. And after launching Living Dappled, connecting with this community, I started to see a lot of really positive change in my life compared to how much I struggled when I grew up with this condition. Um, and I, this actually isn't even just my own story. <laughs> I've seen this in countless other people that I've talked through um, as I've met people in this community. And so as a founder and editor of a pub public platform um, for vitiligo, I often get questions um, from people who are new to the condition or people who are really struggling with their skin. And the question is always the same. What's your advice? <laughs> and I'm always like, okay, well, that's a really big question. Um, and also I have a blog about it. So come hang out with me at Living Dappled. But what I can tell you in a DM, the number one thing that I like to tell people is connect with other people with vitiligo. Um, and by that, I mean, attend a webinar, DM somebody, follow them on social media, subscribe to a blog, hang out with the Vitiligo Society and Living Dappled. Any way that you can really find spaces to talk to other people, hear their stories, share your story, um, and feel inspired by just seeing the lives of the people um, who are living with this condition, I've found to be incredibly powerful. Um, so again, my name is Erica Page. Um, I've been a vitiligo, vitiligo advocate um, more publicly for about six years. I write frequently alongside other contributors on livingdappled.com. Um, you'll also find me across a couple of other sites. I try to get the word out about vitiligo and raise awareness every chance that I get. On a more personal level, I have been on a journey to love my own skin for more than 20 years. And we will talk about this, but I have been um, at rock bottom crying on my floor. I'm going to get emotional even talking about it um, and feeling like completely trapped. And today I'm sitting here feeling a lot more confident and comfortable in my skin. Um, and my journey isn't over. I um, mentioned that I'm still losing pigment in the hair, in my hair. I also um, am a rather new mom. My daughter will be one in just a week or two. And um, now I have to think about whether or not she's going to get vitiligo. And so I kind of always thought my journey was over once I lost 100% of my pigment in my skin. I was like, what else can vitiligo take from me? Well, we're not done yet. Um, so I'm right there with you in this journey. And I think what's interesting about that is that I'm sure everyone on this call is coming into this conversation about vitiligo at different um, points. Like maybe you just got it. Maybe you've had it for a while. Maybe you're the mom or a friend 
Um, maybe you're struggling with it. Maybe you feel good. I have walked and lived in most of your shoes at this point of my life. Um, and so all that to say, um, I get you, I feel you, and I'm excited to share this message with you today. So here's what we're going to talk about. We have about 30 minutes or so. So I want to share a couple of things with you all. The first one is how um, connecting with the vitiligo community really changed my life with vitiligo. So I'll share a little bit about what it was like to grow up, start connecting with the vitiligo community and kind of how that impacted my life. I'll also share a little bit about literally how community can change your life. So for those of you who love evidence um, and data, I will give you guys a little bit of research um, into the science and psychology of how we experience vitiligo, um, how we can change that experience, and why community in particular is so important. And last but not least, I want to leave you all with some really tangible, practical tools. So I'm going to share a couple of ways that you all can connect with the vitiligo community today. And congrats, by the way, because you all are here. And so check, we've got one, um, one down. Okay, so to get started, um, I'm going to talk about how community has really changed my life with vitiligo. Um, and I'm gonna set up the story in terms of what it was like growing up with vitiligo when I really didn't know anyone else who had the condition. I'm gonna talk about how I started reaching out and connecting with the vitiligo community. And then I'm gonna share some of the change that I saw in my life during and after the time that I started connecting um, with this community. I'm going to ask a favor of you all. So I know it's hard to chat in this virtual environment. So as I am talking, if you all can relate to something that I'm going through or have gone through in my life, I would love it if you just put same in the comments or you can put yes, agree, whatever it is. But let me know if this story resonates. OK, so growing up with vitiligo, um, as I mentioned, I got it when I was seven years old and my grandmother had vitiligo, my mom's mom. So my mom was pretty familiar with it and she had a hunch she knew what it was, but we went to a doctor to get the official diagnosis. And pretty early on, we decided that I, um, we were not going to pursue treatment. And that was for a number of reasons, but one of them was because my vitiligo was spreading very quickly. We had tried a topical cream and we just couldn't keep up with the progression of the vitiligo. And so I never regretted that decision, but that definitely put my life on a certain track because I was moving forward with this, um, no matter what, in one way or another, like we were, we were going to do this. Um, so it wasn't until high school and college that my vitiligo really started to bother me. And some of the things that happened during that time were that I would have very obsessive negative thoughts about my skin. It was like I couldn't think about anything else. And I saw my entire life through this lens of vitiligo. Like when I met someone new, it was like, well, are they going to like me because of my skin? Probably not because I don't like me and they're not going to like me. Um, you can imagine this like just this negative, like uh, just a uh, train of like talk to myself, putting myself down because I didn't like the girl in the mirror. And so it was so hard for me to imagine that anyone else could like the girl in the mirror too. Um, and I see lots of themes coming in. I've heard this story before from people. And so I'm glad, um, I'm not glad that you can all, all can relate, but I'm glad you're talking with me. Um, uh, I also at one point, probably like lowest of low in high school, I actually deserve believed that I did not deserve friends because of how badly I thought about um, myself and my skin at that point in time. As I moved into college, I, um, and that's probably around the time that this picture was taken in the middle there, I was incredibly spotted. Um, you couldn't not know at that point in time that I had vitiligo. And dealing with stares was incredibly hard for me. I had become a very sensitive person, um, probably because a lot of the mental, emotional um, kind of trauma that I was dealing with as a result of this. And I remember like multiple times every summer, it was almost like clockwork. I would get dressed to leave the house and I would try to put on shorts and I would look in the mirror and I would sit down on the floor and I would cry my eyes out for hours because I could not bear the thought of being stared at one more time. It, and I know some of you can relate to that. Like it was 
so hard to think that I was going to have to go through this again. Um, and eventually you do pick yourself up off the floor and you keep moving, but it always felt like I was trying to move a mountain in that moment. Um, and it was, it was very difficult. So, um, around in my early twenties, it was a few years after college was when I started significantly losing pigment, um, to the point that I wasn't even sure how much of my normal skin pigment I had left. And so I turned to Tanner, um, and I started covering myself head to toe with Tanner because in my mind, that was the way that I was supposed to look. I didn't know who this depigmented girl was. That wasn't me. That's not the way I was supposed to look like. I didn't recognize that girl in the mirror. And so at first wearing Tanner for me was freedom. For the first time in my life, I was walking down the, the sidewalk and I didn't get stared at. And I was like, whoa, this is how people live. I've made it like this is great. And um, that was short lived <laughs> because very soon after that, um, this doesn't happen for everybody. I know Tanner for a lot of people is a really great option to getting a little bit of control and a little bit of your identity back. But for me, it ended up becoming um, a very toxic and negative relationship because while it was helping me to feel more comfortable in my skin, it almost became a security blanket. And the ironic part is that I had spent most of my life at that point covered in spots. And yet if my tanner was one streak out of line, I would have a complete nervous breakdown and would not want to leave the house. And so it just got to a place where it was to toxic for me. And I knew I probably needed to change, but I wasn't sure how to do that. And the idea of leaving my house without anyone, um, with anyone seeing me without makeup or tanner on was completely terrifying to me. Um, so moving on, Again, around that time that I was starting to wear tanner and stuff like that, I started connecting with the vitiligo community. And this was largely through Living Dappled. But I remember before I launched the blog, one of the first things I did was I looked online to see what resources existed out there. And I remember finding a girl about my age. Um, we were both in the same um, career field. We both had vitiligo. We both were dating. Um, we both were wearing tanner. And so I just reached out and asked if we could chat. And we talked for about an hour about all of those things, about how going to the beach is awful and our tanner will come off in the ocean or the pool. So that makes summer really difficult. We talked about how we talk about vitiligo with our boyfriends. Um, we talked about any number of things, as you can imagine. And when we hung up the phone, I burst into tears and it was tears of like therapeutic release and like an overwhelming relief because for the first time in my life, I was understood. Like somebody got me and she understood my story before I even could get the words out of my mouth. And just knowing that I finally wasn't alone didn't solve everything for me overnight, but it gave me a renewed sense of like confidence and a feeling that it was going to be okay like she's doing it. I'm doing it with her. And just having that buddy with me, I was like, okay, like, okay. And so I don't know how to explain it other than I was like, okay, that night. But it was definitely um, a pivotal moment for me in living with vitiligo. Um, after that, I started following a lot of people on social media who had vitiligo. And I'm not going to lie. It was terrifying to me. Because I had spent most of my life up until that point, and even in that moment, trying to hide my vitiligo, trying to pretend I didn't have it, trying to not think about it. I didn't want to be reminded of it. I was like every little time I looked in the mirror was upsetting to me. I hated shopping for clothes because you have to look in the mirror. Like I just did not want to be reminded of my skin. But in order to connect with this community, I started seeing floods of pictures of people with vitiligo. Um, in my feed. And it reminded me constantly about what I was going through. But what was interesting was that over time, I stopped seeing pictures of people with vitiligo. And I just started seeing pictures of people who happen to have vitiligo. And uh, it, it's hard maybe to like really explain what that means. But I started seeing the people first. And I started seeing how beautiful they were. And then the same thing started happening when we were 
doing photo shoots for Living Dappled. We've probably done about nine shoots um, at locations across the United States um, over the past six years. And so I've met a lot of women and these are not models. These are everyday women who were terrified, <laughs> but chose to show up anyway and have their picture taken. And I would watch them be so scared in the moment and we would coach them through and they would always say like, oh yes, well, all of you are beautiful, but me, no, no, not me. And I said, but do you know that every person here is saying that same thing? And you are one of those other people that is beautiful. And so uh, again, what was interesting was that I started seeing the beauty in these women. Um, and I truly believe that that is part of what helped me one day turn around and look in the mirror and go, look at you. You are beautiful and you are you, despite your skin. Your skin is not all of your story. And so that brings me to some of the change that has happened for me personally. Um, one of the biggest things that happened was that I decided to throw away my bottle of tanner one day. I was going to a um, body confidence workshop. And at the end of the workshop, they were going to do a photo shoot. And I realized I couldn't show up to a body confidence workshop hiding the very thing that I was there to talk about. And so I had been kind of curious about what my skin would look like when it was fully depigmented. I had never seen that because I started wearing tanner before it fully finished depigmenting. And so this was something entirely new to me. Um, but I threw away the bottle one day and I didn't know what was going to happen after that. I didn't know if after the shoot, I would put it back on and be like, okay, I'm back. <laughs> I'm safe. Or if I would keep going, um, turns out that I never put Tanner back on. And now, um, a few years after that, I started letting the pigment, um, my vitiligo hair come in. Um, and so that's been another big change for me. And so these two things really are very much about like the physical appearance in my changes, but I can tell you there are a ton of other changes that have happened mentally and emotionally, um, over the years. And like, for example, one of them that comes to mind is that when I first started living dappled six years ago and I would blog in the mornings, um, and just kind of, you know, share pieces and parts of my story or talk about what it was like to live with it. I couldn't do that without crying. And I recognize that I get emotional on this call. So like, sure, I still cry from time to time, but I can talk about my life with vitiligo um, much more easily now without carrying as much of that pain and trauma um, that I have carried with me for a lot of my life. And so, um, Sure, maybe this isn't all because of connecting with the vitiligo community, but I can tell you that spending time around these people and having people that understand you has been a complete game changer in the way that I live my life. And when my daughter was born and people started asking me, aren't you terrified that your daughter is going to get vitiligo? I said, yes, but, and the but is that I am surrounded by a community of people at Vitiligo who have my back and I can turn to in any moment. And that is so different than what it was like for me growing up. Um, and so I told you, this isn't just my story. I've seen this with so many others. And so I wanted to share just two of the stories um, here on this page. So I don't know if Leah's on the call today. She may or may not be. Um, but Leah, I met her at a um, one of Living Dappled's photo shoots. You can see she is a beautiful woman. Most of her vitiligo is on her legs. And um, she came to the shoot in New York. We're in a hotel room. We're getting ready to go out to the Brooklyn Bridge. We had our outfits. So I handed her a dress and I said, here's what you're wearing today. She said, okay. We went out. We did the shoot. Um, and later we were at lunch. And it was only then that she told me that was the first time she had put on a dress that showed her legs. And I said, what? This, this was the first time. And you said nothing to me when I just told you to put on a dress and walk out the door in public. And she was like, no, because I was with you and I was with these other women and it was okay. And was she nervous? Yes. Was she scared? Yes. Did she feel like everyone was staring at her? Yes. But this is like the definition of like the power of community and like that confidence that you can get from being surrounded by people who understand you. Um, the second one, I could not find the picture because this was so long ago. I'll have to dig it up at some point. But shortly after I launched Living Dappled, um, there was a girl who was a ballerina 
who had vitiligo and she messaged me and she said that she is often photographed as a ballerina, but there was only one time that she let the photographer take a picture of her vitiligo, which was just under her chin here. And she said, you can take the picture, but you're never allowed to share it with anybody. And she said, after reading Living Dappled, after hearing these stories, after just seeing other people living with this condition, she was ready to share that picture for the first time. Um, And that just blew me away because once again, it's this idea of connection and community that is giving people the strength to embrace the life that they're in. Um, And I think that's incredibly, incredibly powerful. So if this is something that, if this is the kind of change that you think you would want to see in your life, throw a yes in the comments. Like if you are struggling with your vitiligo and you believe there's a better way to live, like it doesn't have to be like that, put it in the comments. Um, I think a lot of people kind of go through day-to-day life, like real, like struggling, like living with vitiligo is hard. Um, and it can be, you know, really difficult just going into the grocery store and being stared at or thinking about that upcoming family re- reunion where you haven't seen people in a while. And like your skin has really changed, especially coming out of a pandemic. And how are you going to deal with that? Um, and so I, I, I was that person <laughs> a few years ago. And if I had told that Erica that I would be here today talking about this, having in my skin, I would have said, no, nope, that's not me. There's no way, no way on this planet that I could be happy in my skin. I just would not have believed you straight up. Um, and, and that is like the darkness of the place that I came from. And so I only reinforce that to say that like, like if you're struggling to think that like this kind of like happiness or like embracing of your skin is possible, like I I get you because I was you. I, I really do. So let's change gears a little bit. Um, I love asking the question, why and how? I'm a very literal person. And so when people tell me stories about, oh, I, I started embracing my skin and I love my skin now, I go, okay, but like, how? <laughs> like, literally, how did you get there? Because I want to understand and I want to be able to tell other people how to get there. So um, I've spent some time talking to, over the years, talking to a couple of psychologists who have given me a little bit of information about some of the science and psychology that goes into how we experience our skin, how we can change our experience of our skin, um, and then also like why community in and of itself is like so important and that like connection and that like sense of like understanding and belonging. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, I will say, like, obviously, I'm not a scientist. I am not a psychologist. I have no business being one. So please take all of this with a grain of salt. This is me reporting on things um, that I was told um, and that I thought were really interesting and were worthwhile to pass along. But two of the psychologists that I interviewed were um, Dr. Lisa Schuster. Um, She is a child psychologist who also has vitiligo and has done a good amount of work with the vitiligo community over the years. And then also Dr. Matt Schaub, who is a psycho um, dermatologist. So here we go. Okay. The first thing that I want you to know is that it is possible to change how you feel about your vitiligo. And maybe that feels really obvious, but again, like thinking about like old Erica, like I literally would not have believed you. And so I think it's important that we, we just say it, that it is possible (laughs) to change your vitiligo. Um, and I think part of like literally knowing that you can, I think is probably one of the first steps to actually getting there. So Why is that? Why is it possible to change how you feel about your vitiligo? So research shows that it's not the objective severity of an event that makes it traumatic, but rather the person's perception of the severity of the event. So again, it's not the objective severity of an event, but it's the person's perception of the severity of the event. So in this case, the event is having vitiligo or being diagnosed with vitiligo in and of itself is not traumatic but you may have a traumatic perception of living with a condition. And so what this means is that three different people 
could have the same exact vitiligo, but have three different experiences with it. It's why some people are incredibly happy in their skin. They post pictures of their skin. They want to celebrate it. They do their makeup to accentuate their spots on their face. And it's why other people maybe want to cover. They want to um, like wear clothes that hide their skin. They have trouble leaving the house. And both of these are totally valid everyone's experience is your experience. Um, but that's kind of like why that happens. And so because it is your perception, um, it is possible to change a perception about something. And so that is good news. So that begs the question, how do you change a perception? And the answer is action. And here's how this works. So When you look at the principles of cognitive therapy, we just talked about these first two. You have an event that leads to a perception. So you have vitiligo, and then maybe your perception is that it makes you different and you don't think you're you anymore. And that leads to a feeling of maybe unworthiness, maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're sad, maybe you feel lost. Um, And then that can result in action. So maybe because of these feelings, you don't wear a bathing suit anymore and don't go to the pool because you're uncomfortable. Um, The good news here is that you can see the arrow pointing back. So feelings influence actions, but actions can also influence feelings. And so this is where that idea of like fake it till you make it comes in. So maybe even though you don't feel good about yourself, you're going to wear a bathing suit anyway, and you're going to go to the beach. And yeah, maybe it's uncomfortable. Maybe people look at you, but you do it. And when you get off the beach, you're like, wow, that was hard, (laughs) but I did it. And then maybe a few months later, you'll think about doing it again. And then maybe that starts changing the way that you think about yourself. And maybe you start feeling a little bit more comfortable with the skin that you're in. And so One of the things to keep in mind here is that we're not talking about big, huge actions. We are talking about tiny tweaks that can lead to big changes, as said by Amy Cuddy, um, an American psychologist. And I want to give you all an example of this. So I told you all that I, you know, threw away my tanner bottle. I didn't just do that. That was not, I mean, I did it. (laughs) I opened the trash can and threw away the bottle, but That was not my first step. My first step was years before that when it was a weekday night. I had already showered. So no makeup. My tanner's looking a mess. My husband said, I need to run to the grocery store. And I said, great, I'll go with you and sit in the car. Because in my mind, Erica doesn't have tanner on equals Erica's not being seen. That like that was a black and white rule. There was no way around that. And so we pull in um, and I'm sitting in the car watching him walk in. And I had this moment of what is wrong with you? Like, you think you can't go in the grocery store right now because you don't have makeup on? Like, go. And so I made myself get out of the car. I went in. We were in there for five minutes. I felt terrible. I felt like everyone was staring at me. I felt ugly. I was having an internal nervous breakdown. And then I left and I was like, oh, I did it. It didn't feel good, but I did it. And then a few weeks after that, it was the weekend. I hadn't put on makeup and we were going to the gym. And I was like, I should go put on my makeup before I go to the gym. And I said, Erica, what are you doing? Why are you going to put on makeup right before you go to the gym? But I would do that all the time because I don't want people to see me. And I said, nope, you went into a grocery store without makeup for five minutes. You can go to the gym for 20 minutes with no makeup on. And I did it. And then a couple of weeks later, I did it again. And then eventually I started lightening the color of my tanner head to toe so that I was getting closer and closer to where I wanted to be, um, or at least to what my skin was looking like then. And then one day, many times after that, I actually threw away the tanner bottle. And so I share that to show that one little time going to the grocery store, five minutes by accident was what ultimately sparked this entire journey for me. Um, and I couldn't have known that at the time, but it does not take a big, huge thing. I'm not saying like throw away your tanner bottle today. I'm saying try one thing that can help you feel better about yourself. One thing that maybe you're scared to do. So we know that we can change the way we feel about our skin. We know that we can take actions that help us get there. Why is connecting with the vitiligo community, the action that I'm recommending, And the simple answer is that connection matters. Um, We know from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
Um, you can see the third one right there in the middle, belongingness and love needs, intimate relationships and friends. It's right above safety and security. We need to feel connected. And when you live with vitiligo, like we talked about, it's so easy to feel isolated and to feel like you don't have those connections. You don't have people who get you. You you just feel alone. And research shows that having that lack of connection can lead to increased anxiety and depression, among other things. And so feeling connected is important. So with that in mind, I promise I would leave you all with some tangible practical ways to connect with the vitiligo community. Um, and there's great news. Like I said before, 1% of the world has vitiligo. And that is actually a staggering amount of people. That's 78 million people. I tried to look up like literally how many people that is like in football fields or something. It's too many football fields, guys. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of football fields. Um, but the good news is that there are people out there, there are more resources out there than ever today. Um, and so I want to give you guys a few ideas about ways to do this. There are countless ones. These are probably just the most obvious, um, but I'm hoping that they give you some thought starters to take away. So the first one, subscribe to a blogger resource about vitiligo. Um, Obviously, we have livingdabble.com and the Vitiligo Society. There are a number of other resources out there that you can subscribe to to get information about vitiligo. Um, my vitiligo team in particular has been putting out tons of Q&As about some of the science behind vitiligo. And if you want to go straight to the doctors, um, Dr. John Harris at UMass um, is considered like the expert in vitiligo and you can hear it straight from him. He's very great at explaining vitiligo, um, in everyday terms. You can also join a local or virtual support group. This is great if you want to have an opportunity to talk to other people in a small group setting. Um, at Living Dappled, we have the Dappled Darlings, um, network, which is a virtual, um, community through a Facebook group. We meet monthly. We interview people with vitiligo around the world. Um, the Vitiligo Society also has their membership. And then Liddy Ligo and Vit Friends are two of the biggest um, support groups in the United States. Following people, groups, and projects on Instagram. I put some of these as my favorite examples. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with the pigment painter, um, Lauren is amazing. She's so talented. You can submit your picture and your story to her, and she will do a beautiful illustration of you and post it on her site. Bianca uh, Rosemary is one of my favorite vitiligo models. She was actually the first Venus model with vitiligo way back when. And of course, Living Dappled, got to give myself a plug. Join a vitiligo Facebook group. So I found that Facebook groups are where a lot of people vitiligo um, kind of hang out organically. So if you search vitiligo in Facebook and go to groups, you'll see a lot of these. This is just a screenshot of some of the ones that popped up at the top. Um, and there are some for especially like parents of kids with vitiligo. If you're looking for different types of treatments, there's ones about those. There's just general groups, whether you want to be a fly on the wall and just listen in or whether you want to ask a question or share your story. This is a great way to do it. And then attend vitiligo events. Again, congrats. You guys are ahead of the game on this one. Um, but I just wanted to share there's tons of vitiligo events out there. Um, we just at Living Dappled launched a community events calendar. I'm sure the Vitiligo Society also has something like this. Um, we're going to be updating ours once a month. Um, the Global Vitiligo Foundation is also starting a community calendar of Vitiligo events. So lots of resources out there if you are looking for other workshops or webinars um, or anything like that. Okay, so your turn. Um, one more time in the comments. I want everyone to share one thing you're going to do today to connect with the vitiligo community. And while you're doing that, um, I just want to say thank you all so much for the time today. Um, would love to stay in touch. Um, my email and Living Dappled's website are there. Um, and if we have time for questions, um, we can take that, but I'll lean on Natalie um, or Abby to tell me that.
Oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I'm always so blown away when you speak, Erica, because you speak with such a relatable story. You, you're so open and it's so personal. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'll have to say, Erica has been a pinnacle part of this community. And I know a lot of people wouldn't be where they are today without, without Living Dappled, without her you know, personality, her knowledge, and sharing so many, so many stories from people across the globe. So, you know, a huge round of applause for being here today and sharing your story. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate that. And if any, I mean, we have, we've got some great comments coming in, wonderful presentation. Um, people are going to look up the website. I think someone has already joined Living Dapple online. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think everyone feels really, really connected. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I had told um, our host this already. I cannot stick around because I need to get over to the World Vitiligo Day celebration here in Minnesota. But thank you all so much for having me. Um, and yeah, happy World Vitiligo Day. <laughs>